Let's understand what is the difference between climate and weather. The seven elements of uh, understanding the climatic conditions and we would also talk about the major instruments which are used for weather monitoring. We have often heard that there are weather forecasts. We never heard the term climate forecast. So in this session, we would understand the difference between weather and climate. To be very precise, this difference can be understood on three parameters, the time, the place and process. We'll come back to this in a while, but before that, let's understand when we talk about forecasting the weather, on what parameters we do and how we do it. So there could be weather satellites, there could be ships or any other weather rockets or geostationary observation environmental satellites. Uh, now these geostationary operational environmental satellites are used to monitor the weather on continuous parameter. So it talks about the floods, the kind of hailstorm conditions, dry weather conditions. All of those are analyzed through these satellite monitoring stations. So coming on to the difference. Now here there is a windy climate. Now this I do not say a windy climate. Why? Because this weather that surrounds me is at the point of time and it's only at my location. I am here in a windy atmosphere, not you. Okay, so that means considering the fact that let's say both of us could be probably in the same city or uh, could be in the same district, then too in my region it is relatively windy as compared to your region and this is what is called as weather. I'll come to the definition in a while but what happens now it starts to rain. So near me it's raining and this is because the weather has changed. The weather further changed and it is now the thunderstorms, lightning as you can see. So all these weather phenomena are the phenomena that occur on a short basis at a specific given location and can have day-to-day -day fluctuations or fluctuations even within the day and that is weather. On the other hand, when we talk about climate, it is a long-term average. An average of around 20 to 30 years taken over a large region and that determines the climate. So I can say there is equatorial type of climate in the Amazon rainforest and when I say there is equatorial type of climate in the Amazon rainforest, it signifies most of the region that is covered in the country of Brazil, uh, nearby regions of uh, Venezuela and so on. Now when we consider climate or weather, what are the differences? So as we said in the beginning, we differentiate it on basis of three parameters, time, place and process. Based on time, I can say weather is for a short duration of time, climate is for a longer duration of time. Based on place, weather is there for a smaller area in contrast to climate as I mentioned which is there for larger area. So in terms of time and place, it's small versus large but the process weather is a day-to-day -day condition now on what parameters would this day-to-day -day condition depend definitely temperature rainfall humidity wind movements there could be pressure conditions all of those would govern this day-to-day -day fluctuation and this day-to-day -day fluctuation is what is known as weather However, climate is a long-term average and this average weather condition of all these phenomena which are governed by temperature, pressure, wind, humidity, rainfall taken for 20 to 30 years and the average calculations based on it would give us the climate of the region. So climate is known for larger areas 
longer duration of time with an average of 20 to 30 years and therefore the day-to-day -day phenomena that we see around us is not climate it is weather i say the weather is windy i say the weather is sunny outside i never say that the climate is sunny outside so that is the basic difference between weather and climate let's talk about seven elements of weather so the the seven elements here are temperature, sunshine, rainfall, cloud, wind, pressure and humidity. Let's talk about these one by one. So the very first is temperature. Temperature is the degree of hotness or coldness and this temperature depends on numerous parameters. How high I am in terms of altitude? What is the latitude? Is it 0 degree? Is it 90 degree towards the pole? And based on that temperature would vary. Definitely temperature would also vary if I am close to the ocean or I am away from the ocean. What is the soil condition? What is the wind condition? Whether it is day, whether it is night. What is the kind of um, uh, landform or terrain? On all these features, this temperature would be depending. So if you want to understand this in detail, we have covered that in separate lecture. The next is pressure. Now atmospheric pressure in simple terms is the pressure exerted by uh, the weight of atmosphere on the earth's surface. Now anything that is there would exert pressure. Now this pressure varies with time and place. So based on where I am, what is the time and what is the location, the, pre the pressure would vary. Now this also occurs due to differential heating. Differential heating means the land and the sea. Let's take that example. Now wind movement would be caused because of the differential heating and this transport of the heat and moisture would take place and ultimately the pressure would be determined. Pressure is also determined by density and temperature. Now atmospheric pressure simply decreases as you increase in height. So if let's say I am on the foot of the mountain versus I am on the top of the mountain. At the top of the mountain uh, my atmospheric pressure would be very very less in contrast to when I am at the foot of the mountain. Similarly atmospheric pressure is also inversely proportional to temperature. Higher temperature means lower pressure, lower uh, temperature means higher atmospheric pressure and this pressure is measured through barometer. Temperature as we understood previously is measured through thermometer, pressure is measured through barometer. So standard weather pressure we say is 1034 gram per uh, square centimeter and this is usually given at 29.92 inches or we say 76 mm of mercury column. So those are the basic criteria based on which we have the pressure. The next is wind. Now the direction of the wind affects the temperature. Winds usually move from uh, warmer areas. If they are moving from warmer areas, they would increase the temperature. If the winds are coming from cold areas, they would decrease the temperature. So wind has a significant impact on the temperature of the region and is an important element. Now wind direction and speed of wind both of those are analyzed through the weather instruments which we would understand in the next section. The next is humidity. Now humidity is the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. So this humidity can be explained as either absolute humidity or relative humidity. What is the difference? Relative, since it's relative, A related to B or A in contrast to B. So that is always explained in terms of percentage. Very, very important. Absolute is explained in terms of grams per cubic meters. So grams per cubic meters would be absolute. And what is absolute humidity? If I simply want to explain it in uh, words, I can say the actual amount of water pre vapor present in the atmosphere is what is absolute humidity. Relative humidity is the ratio of actual amount of water vapor present in the atmosphere to the total amount of air that uh, a given uh, parcel can hold at a given temperature. So relative humidity is actual amount of water vapor 
divided by the total amount of air that is present in a given parcel at a given temperature so that is relative absolute is simply the actual amount of water vapor which is present in the atmosphere and absolute is measured in grams per uh, cubic meters however relative humidity is measured in percentage the next we talk and humidity is measured through dry and wet bulb thermometer which we would understand next the next is precipitation precipitation or rainfall now uh, rainfall is the most common form of precipitation therefore we say it as rainfall however it is incorrect usage Precip pre precipitation sorry can be under various forms for example snow hail sleet all of those are forms of precipitation so precipitation is water either in solid form or in liquid form which falls onto the earth surface now how we explain it this is simply explained as depositions of atmospheric moisture and therefore we say this precipitation is a important part of water cycle or the hydrological cycle so precipitation is important rainfall uh, which is the most common form of precipitation is measured through rain gauge which we would understand in the instruments the next is sunlight sunshine now sunshine is determined by what it is determined by the latitude you are based on whether you are on the poles or the equator places close to the equator or the tropical regions would have higher amount of sunshine day durations would have higher amount of sunshine in contrast to night and if the phenomena has haze or fog or mist it would definitely reduce the amount of visibility due to reduced sunshine so sunshine is another important criteria and the last important element of weather is clouds now clouds how are they formed any dust particle where the temperature moves below the dew point water starts to condense around it now this point is called as the condensation nucleus or the condensation nuclei now these condensation nuclei come together and form the clouds clouds can be white in color they can be gray in color and they can be further dark if they are moisture laden and would have a higher tendency for rain and these are called as nimbus clouds we would understand the types of cloud in a while but sometimes if the cloud is blocking the sunlight in that case the cloud would appear gray however if not the clouds would appear white and they would be able to scatter uh, light much more easily so that is about understanding the clouds now clouds can be classified under various ways so the first example is a cirrus cloud cirrus clouds are the highest clouds they are around 5 to 10 kilometers high they are feathery in nature and they appear like wisp of cotton the next is cumulus clouds now cumulus clouds are similar to cauliflower and they are having a vertical extension as well but they are also responsible in certain cases for lightning and thunderstorms uh, usually white to gray in color the next is stratus clouds stratus clouds are the lowest clouds usually up to two kilometers in height they are found they are like straight straight lines or sheets in the sky uh, usually gray and dull in color and then we have nimbus clouds now nimbus can be either nimbus stratus or clumbo nimbus both of these are responsible for rainfall so nimbus are the real rain clouds these are usually dark in color and are responsible for for continuous rainfall so here we have understood the seven elements of weather and their importance the next is weather instruments now weather instruments are used to collect the data the data about the changing weather now what are the elements of weather we already know so we have temperature sunshine rainfall pressure wind and humidity we leave out clouds for now so besides cloud we would understand all the uh, elements of weather and their respective instruments just to have a quick information uh, temperature is measured through thermometer sunshine measured through sundials rainfall measured through rain gauge 
pressure measured through barometers uh, wind measured through the speed the speed and the direction direction through the wind vane speed through the anemometer and finally humidity humidity is measured through uh, the wet and dry thermometer now all of those are the instruments that we would understand so let's move to them one by one the first is temperature temperature as we said is measured by thermometer thermometer is used to measure the atmospheric temperature now these thermometers could either have mercury or they can have alcohol very very important to note they can be either degree celsius or degree fahrenheit degree celsius you have the freezing point at zero degree and the boiling point at 100 degrees uh, in degrees Fahrenheit, this is 32 degrees Fahrenheit and 212 degree Fahrenheit. So that is the difference. We also have the conversions for the same. The next is within the thermometers, we need to understand that there is a bulb. Now this thermometer is an example of a mercury thermometer. As the temperature rises, the mercury in the bulb, uh, in the tube would start to rise and the temperature would increase. And this is a normal clinical thermometer, a laboratory thermometer which is used. Now we have a device which is known as Stevenson screen. Now under the Stevenson screen, we have various thermometers. This is the maximum temperature and the minimum temperature thermometer and a dry bulb and a wet bulb thermometer. Note, maximum and minimum temperature thermometer are used to measure temperature. However, dry bulb and wet bulb are not used to measure temperature. They are used to measure humidity. So don't get confused, very, very important. And these all are kept well inside the shade of this Stevenson screen so that the atmospheric disturbances do not bring sudden changes in the recording. They are usually kept at an elevation of three feet six inches and they are kept within this box with the shades as you can see on either side to allow uh, temperature to neutralize across the box and outside the box but at the same time does not uh, make sure that there is no gust of wind which is affecting the readings or uh, affecting the instruments now under this since we are on temperature right now let's focus on the maximum minimum thermometer what are they and how they are different maximum thermometer as the name suggests would give you the maximum reading so it would help you record the highest temperature of the day but how? As the temperature increases, the mercury in the bulb would go up. Now, as the mercury cools, it does not have a capability to move down because the point would have a constriction. Now, since there would be a constriction, the mercury won't be allowed to move down and therefore, the temperature would remain at its highest point. And since the mercury cannot come down, we can record the maximum temperature of the day. So this is a maximum temperature thermometer. It is based on the principle of mercury. So what is required is mercury. Note, minimum thermometer, minimum temperature thermometer requires what? It requires not mercury but alcohol. So here alcohol is placed and when the temperature decreases, the metal pin goes down and it strikes at the minimum point. And once it strikes at the minimum point, that is recorded as a minimum temperature of the day. So we have two different thermometers to record the highest temperature versus the lowest temperature. And as we said, this is kept where? This is kept safely in a Stevenson screen where temperature recordings and humidity recordings are taken. Important to note, this Stevenson screen, as you can see this box, which is called a Stevenson screen, usually is kept towards north. Uh, the door of it, the opening of it is kept north in the north hemisphere and south in the south hemisphere because direct sunlight can affect the temperature and the mercury. And therefore, this is what is done to prevent the direct exposure to the sunlight. Also, the idea is to create a uniform temperature inside the box and this temperature inside the box should be very very close to the temperature outside the box. So maintaining of the temperature through coloring of it and the sheets of it are important. The next is humidity. As we said, 
the dry and wet bulb thermometer which were kept there in the stevenson screen are used for humidity weather office offices use hydrographs or what we call as hydrographs for measuring the humidity now these give a continuous recording of the humidity we already understood what is the absolute humidity and a relative humidity absolute humidity is the actual amount of water vapor present in the atmosphere and is measured in grams per cubic centimeter cube relative humidity is the actual amount of water vapor in the atmosphere to the total amount of uh, air parcel at a given temperature and it is measured in percentage now the actual value of the relative humidity is uh, actually obtained from a standardized table and how does this dry and wet bulb thermometer work so dry bulb readings are not affected by water vapor so under that the readings would vary based on how much water is evaporated but what happens in a wet bulb thermometer in a wet bulb thermometer there is a small muslin cloth which is made wet and it is tied to the end of the thermometer now as there is uh, the muslin cloth which is wet the evaporation would vary now when the air is dry the evaporation rate would be high however uh, the rate would vary on the wet bulb and the difference of that would help us understand how much humidity is there in the atmosphere the difference of the dry bulb reading versus a wet bulb reading now if the difference is very high that means the climate is what correct the climate is arid however if the difference is very less that means even in the dry bulb thermometer the readings were very very close to what is there in the wet bulb and therefore there is high relative humidity the atmosphere around you is humid so probably it could rain so that's one of the guess you can say now what would happen if the readings are same if the readings are same at that point we can say there is a saturation point or relative humidity is 100% because the reading in the wet bulb and the dry bulb is same that means even if i am tying a wet cloth at the end of the thermometer it is not making any difference in terms of the reading just because the fact that the actual atmospheric humidity is so high that the same reading appears in the dry bulb thermometer as well and therefore if there is no difference that determines that the relative humidity is 100% and the air has reached its saturation point so that is about humidity the next thing we measure is pressure now pressure is measured in what pressure is measured in millibar normal sea level temperature uh, pressure is 1013 millibars and which is equivalent to 76 uh, uh, centimeters of mercury column now mercury barometer is a barometer which is usually used so what happens is in a tube mercury is inverted on a platform now when the air exerts pressure the mercury rises and this is a simple principle through which a mercury barometer works now mercury barometer is not portable it's difficult to carry bulky to carry and therefore is not a easy solution so what we do is a substitute to it which is a aneroid barometer now under a aneroid barometer what we do is n means no aneroid means moisture so uh, a aneroid so a plus aneroid so neros is the term which is used for moisture a means no so aneroid means no moisture so here we are not taking moisture into consideration and therefore this is kept in a setting where there is partial uh, air or partial uh, levels of pressure that are seen now what happens is under an aneroid barometer which is much more compact there is a, a thread and a dial now if this push, uh, pin pushes up or down based on that the pressure would change so as the pressure increases the lid moves inward and this changes the pressure to a higher level as the pressure decreases the pin would move up and the pressure reading would decrease now these pressure readings if they are connected to a graph they would be recorded on the barograph and this barograph could give you the reading of the pressure condition so barometer it can be two types mercury barometer aneroid barometer and mercury barometer is a simple tube which has a mercury uh, 
in the plate of mercury now if the air pressure increases the mercury in the tube would rise this is a very simple principle and this is the mercury barometer the next is aneroid i repeat again aneroid does not include any moisture so you would have a dial which would be kept in a closed box or a container and here if the fish uh, pin is pushed down that means the pressure increases so the reading on the dial would increase if the pin, uh, the pin pushes up or moves outward that means the pressure decreased and therefore the reading on the dial would decrease and it does not require mercury so it's more portable easy to carry so it is what is aneroid barometer so barometer used to measure pressure the next we understand is rain gauge rain gauze is very very simple rain gauze is nothing you take a funnel and collect it uh, keep it in a beaker now let it remain in the open in an area where is there is no shade coming in and the direct rainfall can be captured and you keep it throughout the day you contain or you fill the container the container whatsoever gets filled due to natural rainfall is then taken into a beaker where the markings are there and you can read whether there was 5 cm rainfall 15 cm rainfall or whatsoever usually uh, the circumference of the funnel is around 20 centimeters uh, the uh, the usually not the circumference the diameter of the rim we can say is 20 centimeters it is usually kept at a height of 30 centimeters not directly on the ground and at a place where it is away from any place where there can be shade also uh, no animal or nearby organism should affect it so kept in a safer place also sometimes there are self-recording graphs that are used for uh, measuring the rainfall and these are known as pulviographs so pulviographs are the self-recording graphs for recording the amount of rainfall received on a piece of paper so it gives a continuous marking here so rain gears is very very simple a very very basic primitive instrument to help understand how much rain has occurred over the period the next is sundial a very interesting concept now sundial helps us to measure the amount of sunshine how there is a small glass ball as you can see here and behind the glass ball i can keep a piece of paper now the sun rays would concentrate on the glass ball and finally on the piece of paper on the piece of paper the number of burns would determine how many hours of sunshine were there and this is how the principle of sunshine uh, the sundial works the next is wind now wind is measured under two ways as i said the direction of the wind and the speed of the wind direction is measured through wind vane now wind vane is a very simple instrument what has happened here is there is the four directions north south east west the cardinal points which are given and they are fixed they are not moving there is an arrow and there is a tail of the arrow now when the wind blows it affects the tail and this wind vane with the cock rotates or moves and the direction in which it moves implies from where the wind is coming and where it goes so if i say it is northeast that means the wind is coming from northeast going towards southwest as simple as that if i say it's north that means the wind is coming from north going towards south so that is the simple logic of a wind vane now what is wind wind is air in motion now this air in motion can be determined by three things the pressure the rotation of the earth and the friction or any obstacle that can occur now this rotation of the earth as we have understood in our class on coriolis force uh, has been explained there so what happens is the deflection occurs towards the right in the north hemisphere and towards the left in the south hemisphere now pressure now pressure is important we know that winds always have a tendency to blow from high pressure to low pressure so very very important to note and then we have the component of friction the velocity is high in open areas so it can be deserts it can be oceans here the velocity of wind is high why because there is no obstruction and therefore the velocity is higher in contrast to a very densely populated urban area where the wind flow would be obstructed by numerous buildings and constructions the next is anemometer anemometer measures the speed of the wind 
A very simple concept again. Take three or four cups, arrange them in a circular fashion. Now, how much uh, air or wind would be collected in the cup would determine the speed at which it would move. Now, the speed at which it would move, then based on the number of the turns, we would understand how the how fast the wind has been blowing. So there would be a pole on which there would be three and four cups. Half semicircular cups. The amount of wind that would go in the cup would help the cups to move. And based on that, we can understand how fast the wind is. Wind speed is measured in knots. Now, important to note, one knot is equal to one nautical mile. Uh, when I say one nautical mile per hour. Now, important to note, uh, there is a difference between nautical mile and state mile. Now, when I am in the ocean, I use nautical mile. One nautical mile is 1.1508 miles per hour. So, one nautical mile per hour, that is one knot, would be technically equal to this much. However, when we are on land, we use it as equivalent to 1.15 mile per hour. So, very small difference of 0 0.0008 miles, which is there, which is the basic difference between the land miles and the nautical miles, which is in the ocean. And the speed of the wind is measured through knot. And one knot, I repeat again, is equal to one nautical mile per hour. Clear? So, that is how anemometer works. Now, this wind speed is later on measured by Beaufort scale. Now, Beaufort was a uh, admiral and he was on the oceans for a longer time and understanding the patterns of the wind in the sea, he gave this concept of Beaufort scale and now we measure the wind speed on the Beaufort scale. The last important thing that we would understand in this lecture is the various lines that join places of equal things. So, equal temperature, if it is there, we call it temperature. So, therm. Thermometer measures temperature. So, therm. Now, isotherms are the lines that join places of equal temperature. Iso means equal always and therm would mean the temperature. So, in this map, we can see line of 30 degrees Celsius. That means all these cities that are located along this line would have 30 degrees Celsius. So, isotherm. Iso heights. Height means rain, iso means equal. So, these join places of equal rainfall. So, in this diagram, we can see the lines which show the places of equal rainfall across India. Iso bar. Iso means equal, bar or bhar in Hindi, you can understand it. So, bhar or bar is the pressure. So, bar measures the pressure. Now, here, these are the lines that join places of equal pressure. Iso help. Heliocentric theory, we understood helio means sun, geo means earth. So, helio means sun. So, isohel means lines joining equal sunshine. So, places of equal sunshine joined would be through isohels. The next is isoneph. Nephology is where we understand clouds. So, isoneph. Neph we understand as the amount of... Uh, the cloud cover. So, equal cloud cover present across regions would be measured through ISO-NEP. So, those are some of the important terms and the major weather instruments which we have understood. Wish you a very good luck. We'll meet you soon. Till then, stay afresh, stay tuned. Have a wonderful day.